Hello everyone. <coughs> a very good afternoon. And assalamu alaikum. I'm Muhammad Iqbaluddin Arif. Uh, as uh, Jim explained about my academic background, uh, I would like to uh, say a few more things about how I connect to religion. Could you talk a little louder? Like, yeah, or raise the okay. volume on the mic? Is it fine now? That's better for me. It's, it's better. Now. Okay. Uh, during my master's, uh, I developed this interest for uh, research, exploring about religion. And I had two uh, articles, one on uh, the institution of clergy in Islam, I questioned uh, about the originality of the institution of clergy in Islam. In one of the paper that titles uh, Papacy in Islam, where, where did we go wrong? Uh, Martha, it uh, relates to particularly uh, of what you uh, uh, recommended to me yesterday uh, to Riz Azlan uh, uh, commentary on Islam being a scientific religion. He's of the view that Islam is a scientific religion. So in this, in the, uh, this paper, I questioned the institution of clergy in Islam. Uh, then there was this another paper where, uh, which titles secularism compatible or contrary to Islam. And from Quran, I come, come up the view that secularism is compatible with Islam, interestingly so. You know. uh, let me take you back to our topic of discussion today, that is uh, decoding Islam, the approach to ethics. But before that, I'm thrilled to see familiar faces, some new as well. And I'm uh, excited of having another captivating interactive session as we did last week, uh, fueled by your insightful questions and valuable opinions. Let's, we all learn and explore through knowledge exchange, in particularly break the stereotypes contrived by and spread by wasted interests. Let me share with you the agenda for today. We'll discuss what is ethics and I'll be sharing with you about the major ethical frameworks in addition to the Islamic framework of religion. And then in the end, I'll be uh, uh, sharing with you in detail the Islamic foundations of ethics. Ethics, uh, we generally and I do believe you all must be having uh, an understanding. Academically, the word ethics is used as a synonym to the word morality. The two words, the two terms are interchangeably used one for the other. The word morality, the term morality, the concept morality and ethics are referred to, or generally understood, or looked upon as the difference between what's right and what's wrong, or what's socially understood as acceptable, approved, and what is socially understood as not so approved. And I presume you agree with me on that. But a question arises. What do we mean by right? What is right? And what is wrong? What makes a 
particular action, a particular behavior is right in what makes a certain behavior is socially not so approved. Uh, I would like uh, you to, to share your own views, any, anyone for that matter, uh, your own views, your own outlook, instead of you know coming up with any um, academic explanation, uh, understanding. Anyone? Yes, please. Well, all my life, it's always I've heard you say, "Hey, listen, what's right for you may not be right for me." Right? Exactly. Mm. Yeah, that, yes. yeah, that uh, that makes the question more relevant. You know, that, the, that makes the question more relevant. Why? You know, the, the, the concept is what is socially approved and what is socially not approved is the difference between what's right, what's right and what's wrong. The, yes, yes, Martha, please. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what will hurt society that you live in versus... What, what will hurt society, so, such as... Um, you know, pretty much people, I think people should agree that killing someone is... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what's right and wrong has a, um, has uh, the framework of the society in which you live in, if it's something that pretty much everyone can agree to is a bad thing, like, uh, like killing other people, killing people. Perfect. Uh, then it is considered bad and, and uh, not acceptable. But, but when you get to the other side, what is right and uh, and good, that kind of, some, uh, to me, that kind of gets blurry sometimes. Because what sometimes comes around as being bad really doesn't seem to be hurting society, so you say, well then, is it bad? You know, it's, it, it, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of difficult. Is it a cultural norm versus a, you know, essentially a religious or What's coming? Uh, you mean to say how we came to, uh, to understand this difference yeah. You're drawing the difference between what's right and what's wrong. Right. This concept is, interestingly, uh, the, 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 the difference between what's right and what's wrong, largely, uh, throughout human history, it's been universal. You know, honesty, justice, truthfulness, being magnanimous, having fellow feeling, they've always been upheld as good actions, good behavior. On the contrary, uh, Deceit, dishonesty, injustice, cruelty, like you refer to killing others, these are being looked upon as wrongs, isn't it? But as the lady referred to, the very concept is relative as well. What's right for me may not be right for others, for someone else. Truth, we've been told most of the time, you, you must be truthful. Truth is, truth is a good thing. Even religion Islam has put a lot of emphasis of one being truthful. The prophet uh, uh, Leslie Hazelton uh, 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 records that he was known as Alameen and uh, being truthful, Sadiq, a Sadiq being truthful. So that's a virtue. But if I narrate a story which has taken place before my eyes, but that happens to be uh, um, harming someone's sensitivities. Is that a right action? Is that being truthful then right? No, it's not. Isn't it? Uh, we've been told that lying is wrong. And uh, of course it is. But then, Margaret Thatcher, the first British uh, female prime minister and women in majority here, she says, uh, we don't always lie, but sometimes we have to be evasive. 
you know a doctor for example a doctor telling his patient knowing that the patient is critically ill and telling him he's looking good today he'd be all right he's much better is he deceiving him is he lying to him no no that's not so the concept of ethics the difference between what's right and what's wrong it's at one level it's universal but at the same time it's relative it's relative to a situation relative to a frame of reference isn't it you agree yes i just want to make a comment about um, yeah, sure. margaret thatcher being evasive um, <laughs> she wasn't evasive when she let all those um, irish kids 19 and 20 years old die in, uh, in prison when they won't stop it well I, I limit uh, my discussion to that particular uh, <laughs> statement relevant to, to the discussion here. Uh, uh, I'm not commenting on her political record. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so, um, there are professions that have um, ethical rules or standards. Mm -hmm. that, uh, so I believe medical mm -hmm. uh, and Certainly engineering, for that matter, law, yes, and legal ethics, medical ethics, engineering ethics, yeah, yes, sure, so business ethics. It's a different kind. Of, there's a standard, and that's yep. laid out, and not always that clear. Because uh, yeah, I know if you work for the state, you have to take this little ethics test. And sometimes it's tricky. AI, artificial intelligence. <laughs> Uh, what's your question? That's uh, is that oh, a comment? Oh, it was a comment about okay, that. A comment. It's yeah. not just of the social, we you know, right and wrong. But I mean, it is, it is about right and wrong. But but there are standards that are set out for certain professions that that ethics are very important. Yeah, very important. Very important. I'll be I'll be uh, responding to that at the end of the the, the session, pretty much in detail. Uh, I hope you remind me if I forget <laughs> that part. Okay, yes, sure. You know how some people do the right thing for the wrong reason? Where does that fit in? <laughs> uh, if you could... I, you know, I, I don't mean to be funny about it, but it's true. Sometimes you do the right thing for the wrong reason, or you do the wrong... I don't know if you do the wrong thing for... Maybe you can do the wrong thing for the right reason. I don't know, but that, that kind of was going through my mind talking about all of this. Okay. Uh, that, uh, in fact, I believe... Uh, uh, makes this discussion more relevant to understand why why should Iqbal or anyone else for that matter take a particular decision what should be the foundation of taking a certain decision okay. let's see through different frameworks how these different frameworks ethical frameworks they uh, uh, they attempt to explain ethics uh, is you uh, questioned why and how a particular action is to be looked upon are categorized as good or bad desirable is not so desirable so there are four major ethical frameworks virtue ethics utilitarianism uh, deontological ethics and religious approach and I'll be specifically focusing on Islamic approach at the end but I'll be briefly uh, touch upon uh, the religious approach in general as well uh, ethical frameworks uh, whichever the uh, whichever one uh, uh, we discuss they attempt to explain the existence and facts of ethics and ethical behavior primarily so what is right and wrong and why certain actions behavior is termed or considered as right and others is wrong and let's uh, step into the first one that's virtue ethics it's primarily aristotle's uh, concept of ethics uh, uh, Aristotle is of the opinion that all objects have a talus, the Greek word talus, and that means a purpose, object. An object is good when it properly secures or performs its purpose, its, its, its talus. 
For example, the chair. The purpose of the chair we all are aware of. It serves its purpose, then it's good. And according to Aristotle, what's the talus of human? That is a human being aware of his reason and using his reason, his intellectual faculties. And if he is using them, that him being good. Uh, these concepts uh, overlap at certain levels. Uh, the same uh, reason uh, being discussed by, uh, and you'll see, uh, I'll be explaining by Emmanuel Kant and deontological ethics. And it is very much identical to what Quran tells us. Uh, Allah in the Quran says in chapter 91, verse 8, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah says, I enlighten human soul with the faculty, with the ability, the capacity to differentiate between what's right and what's wrong. So, the faculty of reason. Uh, utilitarianism, they approach utilitarianism uh, primarily uh, expounded by uh, Jeremy Bantham and John Stuart Mill. And this concept, as you could see even in the, 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 um, the images uh, displayed over here, it's about the greatest good for the greatest amount of people, the greatest amount of the, the, the number of people. Uh, this theory holds that nothing no action, no behavior is right or wrong inherently, intrinsically. But it's about the outcome. And the outcome, if that outcome is of utility, it's good. And if it's not, it's not. So, what's utility? If you could, you could see in this image, uh, uh, the fella standing, uh, he is supposed to stop the train because that can cause harm. That's very much possible. But he's to take a very quick decision. And he can see that he cannot avoid harm in any case, but he must take a decision. And the decision would determine his uh, ethical framework. You got it? Which one do you agree? He must save most number of people. <laughs> that, that, that is an act, uh, utilitarian uh, act. Or is it um, the, the man on the, the single man is Einstein? Mm. You know, someone who's... He gives a lot. Yeah. In, then Excellent. You're looking beyond that, that immediate. Very good. That's the criticism on utilitarian approach. Utilitarian approach, let me share with you and uh, a bit more about it. Uh, this is an approach, an ethical framework that we most often follow practice. You know, in a routine life, most of us. But whether the decision, the action, uh, is right or wrong, that is largely questionable. And let me share with you from cultural norms to uh, very, uh, you know, having huge impact political decisions. The war on terror, for example, you know, uh, some transgressors committed an act, the 9-11, killed people, and then a decision was uh, uh, taken at a higher level to pursue, to punish them. And to share with you about my country, I'm from Pakistan, we suffered 80,000 people got killed is the aftermath of the, the war on terror, a more than a billion dollar loss to the economy. Uh, there is this custom, a cultural custom, which is called swara. Uh, the custom is about in order to 
reconcile two uh, families, two groups, caught off in a in a in an um, extensive feud, which has caused the killing of people on both sides. The cultural norm is to reconcile that through a local council. And that is called, the, 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 the mechanism is called Swara. What is Swara? Swara is, you know, how to bring the, the, the two uh, 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 fa uh, the groups together, to reconcile them. To uh, uh, wait of a woman into, from one family, from the victim family into the uh, uh, from the um, uh, from the uh, oppressor family into the victim family, and that's how. So, woman is used as, a, as an object, an object of honor. From the op oppressor family, a girl or woman should be married into the a female should be married into the the victim family to restore their honor. One, the woman is used as an object, an object of honor. Should she be? She is a human. No, she shouldn't be used as an object. What happens? Uh, it used to be. Uh, luckily, uh, because of education, because of the media, um, uh, this custom has, uh, you know, has been rid of uh, for better. But it, it, it used to be prevalent. There are uh, parts uh, in Afghanistan, in, in Pakistan, where it's, it's still, it's, uh, it's, it's practiced. The, 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 the members of the council, the jaga, the local council, the panchayat, they are aware of the fact that the, the decision, the free will of the woman hasn't been taken into consideration. But she is wit. Now that's both an Islamic. In Islam, the, the girl must be, the, both the partners, they must be asked prior to uh, their marriage of their choices, of their free will. The decision must be made out of free will, of free assent. So, in order to, that they are aware of, it's a utilitarian decision. In order to end the feud, to reconcile a conflict which has caused losses to the family, to the economy, to the education, That is an utilitarianism. So, uh, you're right. Uh, and political decisions. There is another one. Let, let me share with you. Uh, of, uh, this is perhaps prevalent all over, uh, but in third world countries mostly, the law enforcement agencies, what they do, when they fail to apprehend a fugitive, they get hold of the family. The family members, this, irrespective of whether the family members being accomplice with the the, the 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 person involved in any crime or not, but get hold of the family, apprehend the, the family members, use them as a bed, and get hold. Is that the right approach? No. This this is an act utilitarianism. But the 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 concept says, in order to to serve greatest number of people. You know, we will be having a comparative analysis of all these at the end, and the decision is for you to make which concept is better. You're free to make your decisions. Okay, uh, let's move ahead. In fact, Emmanuel Kant, the, uh, the 18th century philosopher, uh, the Renaissance period philosopher, who came up with uh, his his famous uh, motto of "Dare to Know." that man must question and question everything and he questioned uh, utilitarianism on this very subjectivity of it the, the very nature of it it's very subjective in nature so he came up with his own concept you questioning something you questioning a narrative you questioning um, a particular opinion you must be having a counter narrative a counter view to that and rationality tells us that we even then be open to be uh, uh, to be to be proved wrong. If and if that's the case, we must accept 
being wrong. So, uh, do, what is deontological ethics? Emmanuel Kant is of the opinion that rules should be the foundation of ethics. Rules should be the foundation of ethical behavior, of ethical conduct. But again, what rules? And whose rules? And who is going to make rules? To that, he responds with his theory of hypothetical imperative and categorical imperative. Hypothetical imperative. By a hypothetical imperative, he means uh, that in a life, routine life, whether it's personal life, private life, social life, political, there are certain activities, certain behaviors that we perform because we are conditional. We are hypothetically involved. For example, if I, if I have to, uh, to reach to a certain goal, there are certain defined way to do that. Uh, the, the, the region that I come from, um, socially, uh, we are indoctrinated that if you want a good position, socially, you need to pursue education to have a good degree. If you want to earn more, uh, of course, lawfully, you got to pursue education to have a good degree and uh, getting a good job. So that's conditional. But is that the only way to do that? No. I mean, most of the, the richest people that we know today, uh, uh, not many of them having the, the highest degrees. Not at all. The Stu Jobs and uh, um, yeah, uh, Rafael Buffett and um, uh, Bill Gates, they're not having degrees, not necessarily. Uh, and then categorical imperative. Uh, likewise, what, let me give you one more example. If we uh, uh, feel like eating, you know, having a meal, to uh, and likewise our, to quench our hunger and thirst, we need to uh, to drink and eat. But what to drink and eat? That is not binding on us, isn't it? We can have a soft drink, a water, and to quench our thirst. So that is conditional. That to to take anything to quench your your hunger and thirst, that is not binding on us. Then there are certain actions that uh, Immanuel Kant is of the opinion that that is binding on us. That we don't have any choices, like what to eat. Uh, uh, what to drink, to quench. For example, the very concept of life, and this is a layman's uh, explanation. It's not technical at all. You know, you can question it. And if you question it, it's, it's a very layman's explanation. Life is, what is life? Uh, it's, it's a combination of the body and soul. That's how. You know, uh, for God forbids uh, anyone hear the news, but when the doctor comes out of the uh, surgery or um, operation theater and he says, no more. That means no more life. What's missing? Life is a combination of the body and the soul. Hmm? And if there is no, the, uh, the soul has parted the body, there's no more life, isn't it? So, likewise, uh, a patient, God forbid again, a coma patient, a, you know, uh, on a bed for, for ages, and we, we do hear about patients being on bed in coma, in the state of coma, for 10 years, for 20 years, Euthanasia is questioned ethically. Hmm? The concept of euthanasia is questioned. So uh, there are many uh, who, despite of in that state of uh, coma, uh, they are not declared dead because the the, the soul-body combination is still intact. 
Emmanuel Kant makes this analogy and tells us that we have two faculties. One, when we claim ourselves being human, we have two faculties. One, having a reason, I was telling you earlier, uh, what Aristotle referred to. The, the very purpose of man's existence is having reason and he must use his reason. Uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, uh, in his very famous book, the, pure, the, the Critique on Pure Reason, he reminds us, he, he, he tells us that man having reason must use, must be moral. Using his reason, he must be moral. No, man using his reason, he cannot act immoral. And if he's, if he's acting immoral, that means he's not using his intellect properly, his, his reason, uh, his rational faculties properly. You agree or you don't? The decision is for you to make. Uh, so I expect we, I, I'll be having a lot of in the question and ask session. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but who determines yeah. what, whether they're using their reason properly? Immanuel uh, Kant is, you know, uh, I told you that we be having a comparative analysis. We be uh, trying to identify uh, uh, what's what doesn't appear so right with any of the concept. You know, even the Islamic concept is open to be questioned. We are here to rationally assess these concepts and make a rational conclusion, a rational inference. Is that fine? Okay, let's get to the religious framework. The religious framework generally upholds the view that you did as you were commanded and right was defined by religious belief, commanded by the, the, su uh, the supreme being the su uh, and that the concept of right and wrong, the differentiation between what's right and what's wrong, that's been done by the supreme being. That's communicated to the religious scriptures. Different religions have different ethical stresses, uh, injunctions, instructions. But there is a broad agreement amongst religions about core ethical attitude. Let me share that with you. As you could see, all religions agree. Christianity, uh, in this uh, Citation from Luke 6.31 and Matthew 22.39, it says, Treat others as you like them to treat you, and love your neighbor as yourself. Hinduism, again, in their um, uh, holy book, Mahabharata, it is said, Let not any man do unto another any act that he wished not done to himself by others, knowing it to be painful to himself. The same has been repeated in Confucianism. Uh, do not do unto others what you wouldn't want them to do to you. Buddhists believe in the same. Hurt not others with that which pains yourself. Judaism, what is hateful to yourself, do not do to your fellow man. In Islam, it's a famous tradition, uh, or hadith of the Prophet, no man is a true believer unless he desires for his brother what he desires for himself. So what I desire for myself, and let's connect it to that reason part. What I don't desire for myself is a rational person. You know, how could I desire for myself something which I don't like? That could be anything. Any behavior that I looked upon is uh, undesirable, I shouldn't uh, subject others to, to go through the same, to experience the same behavior, isn't it? Islamic ethical framework. Let me. So, young, the 
الليل كالقمر ولا الليل سارق النهار وكل في فلك يسبحون. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, most of the time uh, we are we being told that uh, religion versus science. You know, there is this debate of religion versus science. Uh, interestingly, uh, in this concept of ethics, uh, in particularly speaking of Islamic concept of ethics, there is this agreement between science and religion. I'll be uh, translating this verse of the Holy Quran later, but prior to that, let me uh, bring your attention to the fact that, you know, looking around, having uh, an observation of whatever is happening around us, it is administered by rules. From the tiniest, from whatever little scientific knowledge I am having, uh, because of the basic science knowledge in my early schooling, subatomic particles, nanoparticles, from these to the gigantic celestial bodies, the planets, the, the stars, the, the galaxies. Our sun is a medium-sized star, so there are many others. Today, we, the discussion is, isn't about the universe, it's about multiverse. <coughs> but there's this understanding that every single, from this gigantic celestial bodies to the tiniest particles, every single entity, even our social activities, our private affairs to social activities, to political decisions, they are governed by rules. And I'm not in the, uh, uh, right now I'm not discussing about the right or wrong, but rules. Isn't so? Every single thing is operational, is functional because of rules. Let's take the rules out of the game. What you foresee? Chaos. 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 Destruction, disturbance, complete disturbance. Isn't it? So, ethics is important. What is ethics? This plus and minus, this rule thing. we bring this concept of the plus and minus in the rules into our human life, if we are not happy with life today, why is it so? Because rules are not followed, values are not honored, isn't it? And that's the reason. So rules are important, values are important, ethics are important. I was, it just dawned on me. It dawned on me. <laughs> that when we're talking about treat others that you like to treat you, how does capital punishment fit into that? I'll, I'll come to that later. Oh. I, I, I hope. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm here. Uh, I expect a more interactive session than the last week. And you all, those who were present, they witnessed we had a 45 minutes question and answer session last week, you know, as I told you, uh, I'm expecting a, a more captivating and interactive session. So in this verse that I just shared with you, in the Quran, in uh, chapter 36, ayah uh, verse 40, Allah says, now the sun overtakes the moon, nor does the, the night outstrip the day. They all float in an orbit. There is a proper scheme of things. There, are, there is a proper mechanism which is followed. And this mechanism should be followed. If it's not followed, then as you responded, there will be a chaos. And the same is happening in our life. Because of we fail to comply with the rules, with the 
uh, expected behavior as we, we refer to it, the expected behavior. Uh, if I could request, make a request, you note down your questions and once I finished, you know, that we, uh, is that fine with you? Yeah. Okay. Perhaps you find answers to many of your questions during the discussions all along. Islamic concept of ethics is primarily stems from the concept of rights and duties. Rights. How do we define rights? A right is a claim. And the word claim, lexically, is something which is expressive. You know, if I'm making a claim, this is mine. So, that is an assertion being made. But this is a unique claim that despite of its existence, we don't express it most of the time. But when a situation arises, when a situation demands for us to, to, uh, to express our demand for the right. So, a morally and socially justifiable claim to have something, to do something, or to act in a certain way is how do we define rights. Every, the, the, the concept of rights is universal. We all are aware of, you, you are aware of, the concept of rights is universal. Whether someone having access to the rights or unfortunately doesn't have that access to the rights, irrespective of that, every single human is entitled to the concept of rights, fundamental rights. You would agree with that. Not having access, that means there is a problem with the system. Political, social, whatever it is. But everyone is entitled to rights. This, everyone has this, you know, fundamentally, we, we, we are born with the concept of rights. It's not, we, we are not given rights, rather, we are born with, with the concept of rights. But every, the concept of right, as I told you, it's universal in nature, but it's, again, it's not absolute. It is relative. How is it relative? Every single of the right, starting in perhaps, it's an answer to your question of the capital punishment. Every single of the right, every single human has the most fundamental of right is the right to life. F and then the right to honor, to be given respect to, then the right to freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of uh, property. That's the debate between the, the communist world and the, 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 the western world. That it's it's a fundamental right for anyone to, to earn for himself. It's a private property. But as I told you, it's relative. How is it relative? And this Venn diagram would uh, uh, beautifully uh, uh, describe it. This is one individual. So he's having this entitlement to his rights, all his rights. But this is another individual, and here from his sphere of life starts. So that becomes his duties to the next one. It's my duty to, to let you live, but it's, it's equally my right to be let live, isn't it? It's my duty, it's my right to, to be respected, but it, it's equally my my, my duty to, to respect others, to respect their freedom of thought, whether that's professing a religion, whether that's uh, believing in a certain political ideology, a certain narrative, that's everyone's fundamental right. Who am 
I to impose my opinion on others? In my religion doesn't allow me to do that. There is this verse of the Holy Quran, Allah says, like Rahafiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. For you is your path, for us is ours. This concept of ethical behavior, and I hope you understood this in, the, in terms of the rights and duties. So the Islamic concept of ethics st stems from this concept, that there is an interconnectivity between the Creator, the Almighty, and the creation. So the Creator has his rights, but he is having his duties. And what is his duties? His duties to his creation. Allah in the Quran has followed this, you know, and this I'm telling you as a student of linguistic, and in, as a student of religion, that the very, the diction, the mannerism, of the, the language that's been used, it's, it's superior literature, supreme literature. Allah hasn't demanded blind belief at all. In fact, challenged man to get united in through reason, prove him wrong. And telling man in one of the chapter, which is called Ar-Rahman, he's the most merciful. Time and again, telling him of all the amenities that he has uh, provided him to the mankind, whether that's uh, in the form of nature, the ability to, to, to explore. In the Quran, man's been told about the cosmos, that it is for you to conquer. You know, the great Turkish Sufi, Jalaluddin Rumi, he refers to this one, he, uh, he states that the Almighty addressing the man saying that if I have given wings to you, why are you you're crawling? I've given you the ability to, to scale the heavens through the abilities that I have bestowed upon you. So, one, Allah has challenged us to prove him wrong of him giving us, fulfilling his duties in our rights. That part. Then, he is having certain rights. And to him we have duties. Are we with him in our relationship with the Almighty? We've been asked, are we performing or practicing a life of ethical behavior, of ethical nature, or it's not. I mean, that is for any Muslim believing in him and following that framework is to ask himself or herself or themselves. Then there is this relationship between the human beings. And that is again, we've been tied up by what? By the rights and mutual duties to each other. So, if I have rights, I have duties to others. I must perform those duties. Allah in the Quran says that I'll forgive, I'll pardon you if you happen to be uh, not able to fulfilling my rights. But I won't if you fail to honor your rights, your duties to your fellow humans. Unless those humans pardon you. If any Muslim, it is for any Muslim, if he fails to honor his duties to another human, unless that human pardons him, Allah won't. It is for the human. And we've been told that you must, before your departure from, the, uh, from this life into the hereafter, you must seek forgiveness if you have committed a wrong to anyone. 
this is the foundation of that ethical behavior. Let me take you back to the, the, the previous slide. In Islam, after faith, and that is believing in the fundamentals that we discussed last week, after faith, the second most important uh, belief is to uh, uh, paramount demand of the, the religion is good mannerism, ethical behavior, good character. Purification of character. The Sufis, the Tazkiya, Nafs, purification of the character. The Sufis uh, preach what? Purification of character. And that is called in the Sufis language Tazkiya Nafs. Nafs is the self. In Tazkiya, the word Tazkiya means purification. So, purification after faith, the next most important demand of the religion of Islam is purification of character. Allah stated, as I told you earlier, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا I have given you the faculty to reason, to use your reason, to differentiate between what's right and what's wrong, to make the decision. And to make the decisions, uh, the question that you asked, perhaps it be an answer to some of the questions, that it is for you to make a certain decision. A decision which may not be of truthful nature, for example, which may be lying in a, in a, in a, in a given situation, but that lying would be a preferred act than being truthful. To save someone's life, for example. So that's why ethics are relative. You know, uh, and we've been uh, not to impose our opinion on others. In the Quran, Allah says, He who comes to him is a believer, having done good deeds, shall be exalted to the highest ranks. He will abide forever in the gardens of eternity. That is the recompense for those who purify themselves, having good character. This is chapter 75, verse, uh, uh, um, uh, chapter Taha, uh, verse 75, 76. At another place uh, in the Quran, Allah says, This Quran guides to the most upright way and gives good news to the believers who do good deeds. I was sharing with you uh, prior to the session with Jim about this uh, 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 particular verse that we've been told wa tiyullaha wa tiyur rasoolu lil amri minkum Allah says you have to obey the Almighty His scheme of things we've been given that in the Quran in the Prophet and then the law, the law of the land, the rules, the injunctions, instructions. Similarly, as I, I shared with you in this verse that we've been told that we have to obey the Almighty, the Prophet, the Prophet views on ethical behavior. The Prophet says, uh, this is a very famous tradition of the Prophet, I have been sent to perfect good character. That means Islam in totality is about ethics, about purification of character. In its totality, whether it's your relationship to oneself, relationship to oneself. A relationship to oneself means I'm a human, I've been sent on earth with set of responsibilities. Foremost, to use my reason. I've been instilled with this ability to differentiate between what's right and what's wrong. 
And to be able to differentiate between what's right and what's wrong, foremost, if I don't honor those faculties, that means I'm deceiving myself as a human. It connects with that Jalaluddin Rumi's saying, the Almighty given you wings to fly, to scale heavens, while you, you're crawling. Uh, a great national poet and philosopher, Iqbal, coincidentally my father given me the name Iqbal after him, uh, uh, Alama Iqbal, a Sufi himself. He in his concept of the self-esteem, and he in one of his verses says, Khudi ko kar bulanditna, ke har takdeer se pehle khuda bande se khud puche, bata thiri reza kya hai. He says, you got to believe in your self-esteem. And what is self-esteem? That is understanding you being human and you are a vicegerent on earth, a caliph on earth of the Lord. You have a very special place. Ashraful Makhlukat, the superior creation of the Lord. Mankind being told that you are the superior creation of the Creator, have the abilities, the capacities to establish justice on earth. That was the, the paramount message, that was the, the foremost message that all the prophets brought to establish justice on earth. Walakad karamna bani Adam in one of the surah Allah says, uh, I confer dignity upon humanity. It's, it's about humanity. It's not particularly the, the, the people believing in Prophet Muhammad, but bani Adam, the descendants of Adam and Eve, says they're worthy of respect. Who am I to uh, to look down upon anyone because of his uh, skin color, because of his coming from a particular region, uh, because of uh, having a particular financial status in society, or not having that status? No, we are not entitled to do that. We must respect humanity. So, likewise, socially, we must honor our social responsibilities. Perfection of, uh, um, uh, perfection of character, that he being sent, the prophet being sent to perfect character, good character. That's purifying human being. Individually, socially, and then in all spheres of life. And at another place, the prophet says, the best among you is the one who is the best in character. Nothing is heavier upon the scale of the believer on the day of resurrection than good character. Verily, Allah hates the vulgar, the obscene person. Now, these uh, injunctions, instructions being communicated in what we uh, follow is Muslims Sharia. Sharia is the Islamic law. Contains rules of behavior. Uh, let me share with you uh, a non-Muslim's understanding of Sharia. <laughs> a professor, uh, coincidentally from UMass, uh, UMass Amherst, a professor of political science. For many of us in America, Sharia is a household word, familiar from the media and political debates. But what is Sharia, and how much do ordinary Americans really know about it? We may think of it as Islamic law, but that doesn't tell us very much if we know little about the Islamic tradition. I'm not a Muslim myself, but I am a scholar of Islamic law, and I often find myself introducing Sharia to college students whose only knowledge of Islam might come from news reports about distant and confusing events. I tell them that for Muslims, Sharia means the way or path to God. 
I also explain that it's broader than just law and refers to the very idea of God communicating with humans through revelation. This is why for Muslims, the Sharia includes God's messages to previous prophets, from Noah to Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. This shouldn't be a surprise. Muslims see God's revelation to Muhammad as a continuation and completion of the message revealed to the earlier Jewish and Christian prophets. But while the Sharia is not just law, it is law. It contains rules of behavior. But Muslim legal scholars of the past describe the Sharia not so much as a codified rule book, like our tax code, nor as merely a set of higher principles, like the idea of natural law, but as the ongoing search for God's prescriptions for human action. Like the Mosaic law, the Sharia is the discovery of the rules that will allow believers to obey God. Muslims understand that these rules of Sharia reflect broader purposes and values. Scholars and theologians have traditionally said that the entire Sharia is designed to protect human welfare, which they define through six core universal interests, life, religion, reason, wealth, family, and honor. For example, the Sharia prohibits the consumption of alcohol, but scholars don't just say that this is because God has forbidden it, but also because it is God's will that humans protect and preserve their reason or intellect, which is necessary for making correct moral decisions. The Sharia also prohibits sexual relations outside of marriage. This is not just because of divine decree, but because it preserves family bonds. At the same time, the Sharia prohibits false accusations of sexual immorality. This protects human dignity and honor, which are necessary for living a good life. So the Sharia should first be understood by its goals and values before its rules. What then are those rules? And if they are not codified, how are they known? Muslim jurists discovered these rules through four primary sources, the Quran, the words and actions of the Prophet Muhammad, the universal agreement about a matter by the Muslim community or its scholars, and the careful use of analogy. Law usually refers to the public sphere, but most of the Sharia's rulings are about private spiritual practice, such as prayer, fasting, charity, and so on. And while rulings on social relations from marriage, divorce, sales, contracts, and inheritance remain a living part of the Sharia, their implementation in modern societies varies from country to country. Sometimes it is based purely on personal conviction, as in the case of American Muslims voluntarily giving to charity or following Islamic finance laws. Importantly, very few of the areas of behavior and social relations that the Sharia governs have only a single rule on which all jurists agree. Scholars always accepted and recognized reasonable disagreement because interpretation could rarely provide complete certainty about God's intentions. Yet this did not mean that anyone could just impose their own understanding of God's law on others, especially through force. While the Sharia also encompasses certain rulings on civil procedure, aspects of crime and punishment, and even warfare, only public authorities could establish courts with the power to enforce Sharia rulings. Today, this has changed in a number of ways. In nations where Muslims are minorities, such as the United States, Muslim scholars emphasize that the Sharia makes it obligatory for Muslims to follow the secular laws of the lands where they live. In many Muslim-majority countries, it is now the state alone, and not scholars who specialize in the Sharia, that decides what will be enforced in courts. And the state's rules are completely divorced from the sophisticated methods and culture of traditional scholars. So when we say that some modern states apply the Sharia, we need to remember that states may have picked and chosen certain rulings, but isolated rules alone don't represent the meaning and spirit of the Sharia. But this is what is still true for Muslims today. They see the Sharia as primarily about finding the path to God and about making this world an abode of justice. In other words, for Muslims, 
The Sharia is about protecting the most important human interests and values. Life, religion, wealth, reason, family, and honor. I'm Andrew March for the Amir Stein Center. I hope that I hope uh, it would have clarified uh, many questions. Uh, prohibitions. What are the major prohibitions in Islam? The Islamic cons concept of ethics uh, uh, revolves around this fundament these fundamental seven points. That is, Allah Almighty is the Creator of the universe. And he is the source of all good. The first one. Then, what's the status of man? The status of man is that he is a dignified creation of his creator. In his caliph on earth. Thirdly, that whatever Allah has created in the universe, that is to serve man. That is help mankind that is to serve mankind fourth that Allah by his mercy doesn't hold man responsible for what is beyond his parts his capacities he would have he, he doesn't demand from us what we cannot perform is a human so whatever demands been made from us to do and the Quran Allah reminds us that it doesn't make a difference to him him being the Lord of the universe it is for us, it is in turn, it's going to help us in our lives. If we do good, it is going to make our life individually, socially better. It's going to establish justice on earth. Uh, the, the next one, that Allah, that the path is that of moderation. In rationality, etedal, that is of just, to remain just. You will see in the verses coming up in the slides ahead that we've been, there is this e extreme uh, uh, focus on emphasis on justice. Even in the, in the out of the context, um, narratives that been said that Islam allows a man to marry four times or as much in some parts of the, the world they take it out of the context it is stated in the very verse in the very in the very chapter he been said in it must be taken into account that it was a society the prophet was uh, 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 was revealed upon in the in the in a tribal society where it was culturally prevalent and there was no limit even in today's uh, Middle Eastern world you could see that and in many other parts of the world as well in the words of the Quran it is that you are allowed to do that once twice what's the next one but if you could do justice, and what's the next? You wouldn't be able to do that. So, not. You wouldn't be. Uh, the Almighty tells man, you wouldn't be able to do justice. If you wouldn't be able to do justice amongst them, don't. Justice is the, the, fo the, the, the focal point. Then, there are clear injunctions about prohibitions and permissions. What are the prohibitions? Primarily, these five. The first one, obscenity. And this is this been uh, stated in this uh, chapter, Arab, uh, verse 33rd. Prior to this one, in the previous verse, Allah says, Who has stopped you? Who, have, who has forbidden you from all the amenities that Allah has bestowed upon you? No one. That's for you. But what you're forbidden from? These five things. One, the first one, obscenity. 
and you may question who would define what's obscenity that is collective human wisdom what are values how could we understand honesty is the best policy the collective human wisdom has enabled us to understand there is agreement who who would say that honesty is a bad thing isn't it so collective human wisdom uh, it's not for me or for anyone to impose his will upon others so if a woman decides to put on a hijab who the hell i am to impose her not to wear that if it is her decision that is what we call empowerment and if she doesn't i sh shouldn't be the one imposing my will on others to do that Hum uh, violations of human rights the second most important thing that's been forbidden from is violation of human rights and that is of any human anyone no matter how allah is omnipresent omniscient so anyone that is deceiving himself no matter how uh, um, uh, apparently religious that person is if he is violate is he is indulging in acts of violation of human rights of the other human beings that is a serious offense then transgression lawlessness as i told you a while ago wa tiu llah wa tiu rasul al amr minkum you have to obey the almighty the prophet and then the law of the land the the, the law of the day i must obey the traffic laws i must obey the taxation system i must obey all the the rules regulations over here because that's what allah told me in the quran i must do that making partners with him that's a serious offense shirk making partners with the allah almighty and then the last point that the least is must be uh, i would like you to pay attention to this one associating lies with him anyone using religion taking out of the context verses portions from the quran in uh, trying to build his narrative that be a political nature that be to serve his own trivial wasted interests it's been stated in this verse very vividly in this verse of the quran that that is associating lies with him and that's a serious offense and that's forbidden in islam so if you know uh, sharing with you about that uh, article that i wrote about clergy in islam any clergy using the pulpit of religion for western interests associating things with the almighty for their western interests that's committing a sin this is a serious offense let's go through some of the quranic injunctions about social behavior uh professional behavior is the lady refer to about medical ethics engineering ethics these uh, could be relevant to to both private life social life and professional life equally in this uh verse uh, chapter 5 uh verse 58 of the quran allah says allah commands you to render back your trust to those to whom they are due and when you judge between people you judge with justice so it is even passing a comment you know getting judgmental about people we've been told allah commands you not to do that getting judgmental about people passing on judgments about others and um when you decide about people when you got to um judge in a professional life about people making decision that decision 
th those decisions must be based on merit. Give full measure in way justly and defraud not men of their things and act not corruptly in the land making mischief. Very vividly, it is both for the individual, it is, is a group, is a community. We shouldn't, we've been told, instructed by the Almighty. And the very wording, the language is that of an order. That's a decree. So if, uh, for example, I claim being a believer and I don't, then that's not being a believer. The, the core focus of Islam is less on the punishment, rather more on the faith, the Iman. So a person, a believer, even if he is all alone in his private spheres, he is aware that there are no CCTV cameras seeing him. There is no one monitoring him. He is behaving this belief that there is the Almighty. He cannot deceive him. And that is the driving force. That is the essential driving force. You know, um, having a comparative analysis of, uh, 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 of the, 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 the different frameworks, Immanuel Kant telling us apparently identical notions to what Islam is, that man has reason, the faculty of reason, and uh, man um, having reason, he expects man to act morally and nothing else. That is expecting too much. Islam says the same thing. I enlighten human soul with the faculty to uh, differentiate between what's right and what's wrong. But Allah says, man has been given this will, free will. And he be judged about whatever decision he takes on the free will. And along with that, we are human, we are to err. We need to, need to take that into consideration. Man isn't perfect. Man having limitations, not able to use his reason hmm? properly. What is going to be the case? If he, man seeks forgiveness, the Quran Allah, in the Quran Allah says, Innahu kana tawwaba. He is the most forgiving. In most of the Quran, and Mata would affirm me that after a strict order, after a strict injunction decree, at the end it's been told that Allah is most forgiving. So if you seek forgiveness, He's, he's going to forgive you. Look at this verse, and this is this has more relevance today than ever. And let not hatred of a people incite you not to act equitably. This hatred could be triggered by any notion that be that could be political, that could be religious, that could be ethnic, that could be personal grievances. Let not that cause you not treat others equitably. Look at the very wording. Be just. There is an order. You shouldn't leave this uh, uh, the scale of justice tilt uh, because of the any biasness because of any prejudice, because of any parochial sentiments, it shouldn't happen. That is nearer to observance of duty or justice. This is the key. Avoid most of suspicion, for surely suspicion in some cases is a sin. Spying not let some of you backbite others. It's a very uh, social uh, uh, act, behavior uh, that we've been asked to be careful about. You know, 
trying to find other secrets, personal secrets. It has nothing to do with political activities or something like that. It's about personal life, social life. You know, we happen to be, uh, we tend to at times uh, trying to find others' weaknesses. We, we've been told not to do that. Uh, um, uh, and not to, you know, speak uh, behind someone's back. Uh, we've been told not to do that. Um, and follow not, not that of which thou has no knowledge. Of course, whatever you say, it must be based on sound knowledge. It shouldn't be a, a per se sort of a thing. You have heard something and you then start spreading it. That shouldn't happen. Uh, uh, in help one another in righteousness and piety and help not one another in sin and aggression and keep your duty to God. Uh, fulfill the obligations. So the obligations is both to the Almighty, to the law, the Sharia, uh, in the law, uh, in practice. And speak straight words. That means you need to be truthful. So even if it is against your interest, apparent interest, you shouldn't lie. We've been told very clearly. With that, uh, we come to the conclusion of uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, in that verse on the left side, uh, the Arabic uh, uh, script, it's a Quranic verse. It means uh, Allah says that indeed you are telling the Prophet, addressing the Prophet that you are of a great moral character. And what relevance it has to us? We've been told in the life of the Prophet is an example for you. So he's a Muslim, that is the ultimate example. And not only the life of the Prophet alone, but all the Prophets. We, the, the daily prayers that we perform, the Salah that we perform, we, uh, 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 we recite uh, this Quranic verse, uh, from to you we uh, worship and to you we, from you we seek help. And what is the ultimate help that we seek? That the right, uh, enable us to find the right path. And what's the right path? Ananta alayhim, which you enabled your chosen ones, the prophets. And not the ones who are transgressors. That's the routine prayer that. He, and it's about conscious realization of it. You know, performing, doing it as a habitual act won't serve the purpose. Because the belief is, we cannot deceive him. We deceive ourselves most of the time. And think that we can deceive the Almighty. That cannot happen. Thank you very much. The session is open. Any questions? Sure. We the atheists get into all of this. Or humanitarians, if they don't believe in God. Uh, at some point I did uh, make that reference. Islam says, like Rahafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. There is, at, at, at another place, the Quran says, Lakum deenukum for you is your path, for us is ours. In the Quran, Allah has time and again said, uh, 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 has asked not to blindly believe in him, rather to prove him uh, wrong and it's been clearly stated that that won't happen Islam is one of the most uh, rapidly uh, uh, accepted religion in the US in particular there are many atheists uh, who converting to the religion you know this presentation isn't about um, <laughs> uh, making it a, a typical religious uh, session 
and I wouldn't be doing that. I'm a religious scholar. I do question things in within the religion, as I told you, uh, the, the, the very institution of religion that I question. And let me uh, explain a bit more. Uh, 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 the hypothesis of that uh, paper is that there is no such thing as clergy in Islam. There are uh, primary uh, demands and which which have been met from everyone to to meet. Uh, there are responsibilities which have everyone been asked to uh, to, to fulfill. For example, uh, knowledge has, has been made compulsory, obligatory on every Muslim. And it's been very clearly stated uh, in the traditions of the Prophet that if you do this particular act, that is performing a superior duty. So you will be rewarded more. Um, leading the prayers for example so if I get a chance I would love to do that uh, I don't need to uh, our, the, the, the community or a particular group of people uh, uh, doesn't need to have a particular clergy to do that not necessarily we, uh, the prophet has this tradition uh, which states that the best of the the the, the wedding uh, um, um, uh, ceremony that is performed and if it's performed by the, 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 the elder of the family, the father of the, 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 the either of the partners, uh, spouses, that's the best. Likewise the funeral, if it's performed by the, the near and dear one, that's the best. You seek forgiveness for the departed soul because you f uh, feel the hurt more, the pain more than, than a typical clergy coming through that. So in that paper, the, 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 um, it's not only hypothesis questioning, but I have tried to support that with uh, injunctions and um, um, episodes from the life of the Prophet and his sayings and the Quran as well. And the point is that it, it is a contrived, it is an evolved institution, borrowed institution from other religions, sociologically, uh, culturally evolved from other uh, religions into to Islam. Uh, so, yep, there's a freedom. Well, what happens when people twist the words um, of the Quran or like say in the Bible, um, there are phrases about women being subservient and people use that as an excuse for women not to have pro you know, own property in the past or be able to get a divorce and I'm sure that's happened with the Quran too where people twist the words of the Quran. Uh, Your answer lies over here. Let me... Um, I did explain it, I guess, oh, okay, over here. Uh, it's been said in the last one, associating lies with him. In the last prohibition, the, the, in, in the verse, associating lies with him. Associating lies with Allah Almighty, the Quran, and in the life of the Prophet, associating lies with them, and then b trying to build a narrative for political interest. Uh, along with that paper on religion, I conducted my master research was primarily on how religion, I was looking into how, I was in, uh, investigating how religion and local cultural norms obstruct women's electoral participation. I come from a, an orthodox society, uh, a patriarchal society, more uh, uh, the, the right word. Um, but that is not only uh, 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 um, uh, happening in Pakistan being a patriarchal society, that's worldwide. You know, I w while uh, working on that uh, master dissertation, I was uh, investigating the American political system and surprisingly I found that the political system over here is, is for strange reason, uh, never uh, get out of the patriarchy, of the male dominance. Women being uh, uh, not uh, doing justice too. You know, um, so that's a cultural thing. My results were that it's not religion. It's not culture. What is culture? Culture is collective uh, uh, mannerism of behavior. But if the society is male dominant, 
the man would call the shots isn't it so the very men who obstruct a woman to go out and participate in politics because it's a man of uh, it's a matter of honor for them they don't mind the woman participating with them in the economy of the household it if if uh, it would have genuinely uh, an issue of honor they would have stopped her from participating in both they would have kept her uh, um, uh, within the household but that's not the case the very woman goes um, uh, uh, sharing burden of the uh, agriculture uh, with, with him you know taking responsibility doing all that the, the the difficult labor he doesn't mind it so um, it's a sorry state of affairs islamically speaking it's a serious offense associating lies with him allah has said so or the quran has said so that's that hasn't been the case uh, that was one of the reason uh, why i in the beginning i say uh, i i i very clearly last weeks uh, i also mentioned it that we need to break the stereotypes what the media uh, the, the 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 contrived notions media has spread created and spread we we need to to break that yes so in the number for making partners with him i don't understand can you give me an example uh, our belief is uh, in the oneness of oh sorry sorry you know that's yeah thank you thank you jim uh, i perhaps in the uh um you know uh, got more uh, uh connected with the audience <laughs> didn't realize that i have to be professional <laughs> okay uh, our belief uh, uh the islamic belief is primarily uh, the core belief is in the oneness of the the creator the creator is one uh i last week explained it tawhid the very concept is that that the creator the almighty is one he doesn't have uh, uh associates with him doesn't have a family uh, he doesn't have offsprings you know in this very verse uh, of uh, surah uh, chapter of the, the quran allah says um, he as ahad kul huwa allah ahad allah samad lam yalid wa lam yulad he doesn't have uh fathers no offsprings he doesn't have that he let me again go and quote karen armstrong she is of the view karen armstrong and uh, mentioning her last week you would have uh, searched for her she is of the view that the concept of uh, uh, the almighty the god is more of how we understand him he is beyond our understanding he is beyond that understanding we try to understand him through this concept of he must be having the cause and effect theory we apply the cause and effect theory even on him which 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 is beyond his his being is beyond that cause and effect theory likewise you know as a student of religion uh trying to understand religion through the theory of knowledge i come to the conclusion that the theory of knowledge supports this uh, monotheism as far as is concerned is a religion uh, uh, and why is why is it so the theory of religion uh, how we acquire knowledge the theory of knowledge is about how we acquire knowledge how we able to to know so there are different uh, faculties that we use to to find the five senses the sensory perceptions that we have that we've been uh, gifted with the seeing the the the, the taste the hear and so on but uh do they always give us perfect answers no that doesn't happen scientifically proven scientists came they gave theories 
and then later their um, uh, uh, scientists afterwards came and they proved them wrong predecessors wrong are partly wrong and that's how this scientific knowledge evolves religion uh, as far as this mono, uh, monotheistic religion is uh, religions are concerned the prophets brought a message and these prophets are uh, centuries apart from from each other but despite that distance uh, apart from each other in terms of time uh, none of them uh, refuted his predecessor that that hasn't happened that didn't happen uh, as far as Quran is concerned the Prophet Muhammad is concerned the Quran is more about the previous prophets in telling us for, for example the, about the fasting the rituals that we've been told to do we've been told is these the earlier nations in the pro, the prophets they were asked to do that to perform these so how could is it humanly possible for for two people to agree with each other on a, on a point uh, even in a, in, a, in a matter of an hour that even if we agree on a certain point now there is a likelihood that after an hour we, we would disagree on the very similar point but these prophets had that agreement amongst themselves time for one more one more? <laughs> you can say afterwards. I just want to be respectful of other folks' time here. But just one more gear. That's not my take. You know, that's Jim's take. I, I, I would love to interact with you afterwards. You know, wouldn't mind that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Sure. Uh, the prohibitions seem open to interpretation, and in yes. some situations become very extreme. And those people believe still that they will, that who impose this, believe that they are doing the right thing. Do you see, we're beginning to see revolutions breaking around the world. Do you see the future is, of Islam is changing to a more like, liberal philosophy? Uh, firstly, the, uh, I'll, I'll answer the last part. I believe, it's, I, I claim myself a humanist first. I claim myself a secular. I claim myself a uh, liberal. And I'm s claiming that because I'm a Muslim. I, become, uh, I became a humanist because of what I learned uh, uh, through, through the religion. So that, has, that made me uh, b becoming a humanist. Uh, becoming secular, becoming liberal, like Rahafiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. It's, it's not for me to force others to believe in what I be, I'm believing in. Not at all. The religion, uh, the Almighty, uh, not allowing me to do that. There is uh, telling me that uh, uh, for you is your path, for others is theirs. Um, as far as this interpretation is concerned, uh, there was this uh, one uh, fellow of the Prophet, the prophet appointing him a, as an official to a particular state or province or whatever at that time and sending him and the prophet asked him how he's going to take decisions and the fellow responds I'll seek guidance from the Quran and the prophet again if you in a given situation uh, don't find anything directly uh, then his response is, I'll uh, find uh, guidance in what we see in your life, in your being, as the Prophet. And the Prophet again uh, uh, addresses him, what if you don't find then? And then he responds, I'll be using my reason. We've been given that permission to use our reason. I can differ with the the the. Uh, uh, jurists, Islamic jurists, the fiqh that we call the jurists, the interpretations that have been made. As a, as a Muslim, I'm allowed to read the Quran, to use my reason, and 
um, uh, make a certain, take a certain course of action in a given situation. But that shouldn't be uh, in violation with the fundamentals. What are those fundamentals? Uh, the second one, one, look at that one. I shouldn't cause any human rights viola violation whatsoever. That's been, Islam is, uh, Riz Aslan and that book states, Islam is a scientific religion. Uh, the, the reason uh, of perhaps it's been portrayed as a, as, a, as a religion which is a threat to Western civilization started off uh, as a student of political science, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that, uh, uh, in the 1990s when Samuel Huntington's famous book, The Clash of Civilization, came on the scene. The clash of civilization, uh, you know, the, the, the narrative was that after the dismemberment of the Soviet empire, um, Islam is a civilization that poses a threat to Western civilization. And then a narrative, you know, started building up and all that. Um, we need uh, to today, you know, it's, it's the need of the West, it's the need of the East, uh, both, uh, to, to break the stereotypes. Um, we need to understand each other as we are. We shouldn't indulge to, um, uh, to ethnocentrism, judging others by our standards. My st standards may uh, uh, suit my conditions, uh, my choices, but it may not others. In for you is your path, for us is ours. So that should be the way, uh, instead of you know, um, falling prey to, by falling prey, to stereotypes, we are serving the interests of the minority. Who using, as the lady referred to, who using Quran or other Islamic uh, uh, narratives uh, obstruct women's participation in life in its, itself, we serving their interest. We are helping them. We are helping their cause if we fall in prey to, to, to stereotypes. That shouldn't happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.